Daddy, can I sing tonight? I said, yes. <laughs> She's going to be in Bible school this week. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles tonight, if you would please, to the book of Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 26. Genesis 1, 26. The scripture says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. This is the Godhead speaking. He's not talking to an angel. An angel is not made in the image of God. Amen. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Father, I pray now that this holy word would be blessed by the Holy Ghost and go forth for the purpose that you intended, and it will not return into thee void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the purpose that you intend. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. You can be seated. The book of Genesis talks about Adam being made in the image of God and then God giving him dominion. So there's two big deals going on here. Number one is that when man was made, he was made in the image of God. Number two, God gave him a kingdom. He made him the king over the kingdom of heaven right here on this earth. Amen. Note carefully, when this happened, someone was watching. And that someone is Satan. Amen. There are those who believe, and I tend to agree with them, that Satan at one time had been a king over this earth and had authority and he had a reign. He had power and authority on this earth and that he lost it. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter number 28, Thou wast in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was thy covering, referring to Satan. But he had been cast out. He'd been cast down. A good study, and I've mentioned it to you before, is the progressive casting down of Satan. It comes in stages and steps until he eventually winds up in the lake of fire. That's not where he is. He's not in the bottomless pit. Satan is walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, according to the book of Job. But here he is in the garden. Here he is where man is made from the dust of the ground. God did not announce what he was about to do, no doubt. He simply stepped forth and created this being. And then he made him in his image. That's the great thing about man. This is why the occultists and the Illuminati and the one-worlders want to tear you down and use Darwinian evolution to do it is because they despise the idea that you're made in the image of God. The reason they hate that is because they know that if you really believe that and embrace that, that you know you're better than an animal. And you've got a reason for being here greater than the animal. And that when it comes to priorities, the man takes first place over the animal. And so the green movement and all the rest of this junk that's going on today has to take its place in the sense that they're teaching that we are competing with animals for space on this earth, and so, therefore, the competition should be equal, and the animals should have an equal right and an equal place as you do. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. One human being is worth more than any animal on the face of this earth. However pampered and however much they might have paid for it, it may be an AKC-registered dog that you paid $20,000 for. A little girl or a little boy, is worth far more yes, than your dog. Amen. By the way, for those of you that don't know this, a woman almost died in Great Britain. She almost died. Say, how come, preacher, from kissing her dog? Dogs and cats, if you don't know it, have bacteria in them to allow them to eat stuff you don't eat. Amen. A human being's diet is greater than any animal on this earth. Cleaner. And therefore, you can't handle what dogs and cats eat. Amen. So you might want to think about kiss. Kiss your grandchildren. 
Kiss your grandchildren. Yeah. Pet your dogs. <laughs> Somebody said this generation kisses their dogs and kills their babies and aborts them. Amen. I don't want any part of a crowd like that. So therefore, they elevate an animal to the position or even higher than a human being, and it's wrong. Now, if they can make you think that you're an animal, make you think you're nothing but a biological animal, just a little glorified ape or something like that, they can control you better. The idea is control, and they can control you because they've dehumanized you and brought you down to a level where God didn't put you. God made a man in his image. Now, that image of God's a different study. I've talked to you before about it, but in the context of the message tonight, just put it in your mind that when man was made in the image of God, God had one primary reason right off the bat, and that we would be the king over the kingdom of heaven. Another way to understand the kingdom of heaven is to say it like this, the kingdom from heaven, the kingdom from heaven. That includes all the stars and all the planets and all, all, everything that you can see physically. That's the kingdom of heaven. Amen. I mean, after all, if you were on, uh, let's say you were on uh, Pluto and you were looking at earth, would earth be in the heavens? Yes, sir. Amen. Of course it would. Of course it would. So therefore, if you're, if you're there looking here, you'd say, my goodness, look at that, that, look at that beautiful uh, green and blue and white planet out there in the solar system. It's in the heavens. And so Adam was made king over the kingdom of heaven, given a crown. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter number 1 in reference to this event. Hebrews chapter number 1. Chapter 2, rather. Hebrews 2. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 7. The verse 6 says, But what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands, and put all things in subjection under his feet. So God gave Adam a kingdom and made a king over that kingdom, handed him great authority and great power. Adam, no doubt, was a, was, he had to be a very, very brilliant man. He named all of these creatures on this earth. I just watched a little short documentary about this ark that they've made up in Kentucky. I don't know if you know about this thing. It's kind of slipped up on us. That's a magnificent thing. That thing is, uh, is apparently in scale to the, to the ark of Noah. Amen. And the kids, they were asking him, what do you think about this? And the kids were saying, it's big. <laughs> and it is big. Yeah. And the reason it's big, because it held two of all the animals. They came two by two. How'd they know where to go, preacher? The Lord led them there. Yes, he led them there. And he saved the breath. He saved those that breathed and walked on the earth. But who was in charge of it? Noah. And his name means rest. And God carried them across the flood from the old world into the new world. And why did he do that, preacher? He did that because he intends for this world to survive until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Satan was there and he watched Adam. He tempted Adam. He tempted his wife. The Bible said in the book of Timothy that the woman being in the transgression, the woman sinned, the woman was deceived being in the transgression Apparently, there was all, every intent in the mind of Satan to come to the woman first and not the man. He didn't try to tempt the man. He didn't try to cause him to fall. I believe Satan knew that if he could get to the, get to the woman, he'd get to the man. And that's exactly what happened. For the Bible says that this Adam was the first Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ is the last Adam. Yes, sir. The Bible says that this man is the first man, Adam, and the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ is the second man. Amen. Don't fly over that. That's very important. Because this first Adam is so much like the last Adam that it's kind of hard to tell them apart. One of them is the son of God by creation and the other is the son of God by, by essence Amen. throughout eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ. One of them was created perfect. He was created holy. He was created without sin. And there he was placed in authority over this earth, separate unto God, and he sinned. Amen. When he sinned, folks, Satan got back what he had lost. He got the crown back. When Satan took the Lord Jesus Christ after 40 days out there in the wilderness and tempted him, tried to, the Bible said, now all of these kingdoms are mine and I can give them to whosoever I will. Yes, sir. 
Now, I want you to think about that tonight. I can give them to whomsoever I will. You're living 2016 when you are watching the clash of kingdoms. Not the clash of civilization, but the clash of kingdoms. The satanic kingdom that is headed by the Illuminati and that's headed by, by satanic power is clashing with the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, which right now he has in his church of God on this earth. Those of you in Sunday school this morning, you remember what I said, so this is old hat to you. But for those of you that were not in Sunday school this morning, they just opened up a tunnel over there in Switzerland, and it's called Gotthard, Gotthard Tunnel. That is the longest rail tunnel in the world. It goes underneath the Swiss Alps, 37 miles long. Five or six people died in the building of that tunnel. In some places, it is over one and a half miles deep. They just dedicated that tunnel to their God because they had a ceremony when they opened it up and it will blow your mind at what happened at that ceremony. Yes, they had a goat-headed green man who led the procession who was surrounded by all of his worshipers and they worshiped the devil openly in front of the whole world so the world would understand who their God is. When CERN opened, reopened their, this uh, Large Hadron Collider down there in CERN, Switzerland, 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 when they reopened that har Large Hadron Collider, they put an image of, uh, of a Shiva in front of it. And Shiva is the Hindu god that destroys, but he also restores. So what they're saying to the whole world is, this is our God. We are accomplishing what we're doing. We're going to make the world a better place to live in, and you are enjoying the benefits of that, and you need to worship our God. This is our God. That's what's happening right now. And so the Bible says when the Lord Jesus Christ was offered the kingdoms of the world by Satan, Satan showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And when he showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, he said, all of this is given to me and I can give it to whomsoever I will. That's not an idle boast. If you're willing to sell your soul out to the devil, he'll suck you in tonight. He'll offer you the kingdoms and the riches of this world. He'll offer you things that average people don't have access to. Have you ever wondered how some people skyrocket, skyrocket to wealth and fame? Have you ever wondered why someone comes out of obscurity, oblivion, and all of a sudden their name is a household name? Yes, Have you ever wondered why some businesses and some organizations and some, uh, some companies, for some reason or another, they just all of a sudden, boom, they outdo all of their, uh, all of their uh, competitors? Amen. Could it be that some of these people have sold themselves to the devil and he's offered them the kingdoms of this world? The Lord Jesus Christ said in the book of Luke, he said, the kingdom of heaven, that's the kingdom on this earth, suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. He's, he, these, are, this is not, these are not empty terms. I, in my lifetime, I don't know how many wars I've seen. When I was, when I was a teenager, I went off to the 1st Marine Division. I thought I was going to Vietnam. I wound up in Okinawa, but I was ready to go to war. Fifty-something thousand of our young men died in Vietnam for nothing. Some of you have clothing on right now that was made in Vietnam. That didn't stop anything. Right before that, they had a Korean War. The Chinese joined up with the Koreans, and they crossed the 38th parallel, and they went south. They, went on to, they all went all the way into Seoul. They overran the whole, practically the whole peninsula. And if it hadn't been for MacArthur getting in there when he did and how he did at Incheon, they would have taken the whole thing. But he got in there, and he set about driving them back, and there was a peace. There was a, a, a ceasefire, but there's never been a peace treaty signed between North Korea and South Korea, Korea. And at the 38th parallel right now, they stand and look at each other 24-7. But right before that war was World War II. And right before that war was World War I. And right before that war, war, war was the Spanish-American War. And then there was the Mexican War. Then there's the Civil War. And then there's war after war after war after war. And there's going to be more wars, bigger and better wars. <laughs> They're going to come. And men say, well, I preach you, we want peace. So let me tell you when peace will come to us. Peace will come when righteousness comes. Amen. There can be no peace without righteousness. Amen. And there's only one righteous one. Amen. There's going to be a thousand years of peace. 
There'll be no wars. Can't you imagine? Won't have to lock your door. Won't have to look behind your back. Won't have to worry about your car breaking down, somebody mugging you on the side of the road. Won't have to worry about somebody kidnapping your, your kids or carry, dragging somebody off. A thousand years when the Son of God rules in Jerusalem. A thousand years. The book of Revelation chapter number 11 says that the time is going to come when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. Amen. 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 How are they going to do that, preacher? Revelation chapter number 19 verse 11 says, I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. <laughs> Somebody said, I can't believe the Lord Jesus Christ would make war. You ain't seen war till he makes it. <laughs> and the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that blood's going to flow as high as a horse's bridle. I'm talking about a war to end all wars for a thousand years. He will definitely come take the Antichrist who's building his kingdom right now. And the Bible says he's going to throw him down in front of all the world to see. And the Bible says a fire will ignite within him and consume his body. And then he'll be taken and cast into the lake of fire. Amen. The Antichrist and the false prophet right before the eyes. And while all this is happening, the people are going to say, is this the man? Is this the man? So 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up on this earth, the kingdom of heaven was being offered again because he was the only one qualified from the first Adam, the only one, the only one, the only one qualified to rule over the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven at the same time was the Lord Jesus Christ, and they rejected him. They want a kingdom, but they don't want the king. People want a kingdom. They want peace. They want prosperity. They want all of that, but they don't want the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But you can't have one without the other. Amen. You'll never have it. You'll never have it in your life. You'll never have peace and prosperity and goodness and joy in your life without the Lord Jesus Christ. But 2,000 years ago, he showed up, and when he showed up, he showed up as king over the kingdom of heaven and king over the kingdom of God. And when he did this, they rejected him. And when they rejected him, Satan shouted again because it fell back in his hands. And then he's called the God of this world. Do you know why Satan is called the God of this world? Because he has sovereign rights on this world. He owns it. Right now, he owns it. Not only that, they worship him. They worship him. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter number 13, they worshiped the dragon. That's Satan. Not only do they worship him, and not only does he have sovereign authority over this earth where he owns it, he has authority in this world. Until the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and rose again from the dead, the Bible said Satan had the power of death. Amen. Now, I don't, you, I, don't think, I don't know if you think about that or not tonight, but the power of death means he could kill you. Amen. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, to turn what's such an one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Amen. You see, when the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, there at the cross at Calvary, he there took Satan's power stripped it from him where he can't just do as he pleases. Amen. If you'll remember over there in the book of Luke chapter number 22, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But he said, what have I done for you? What did he say? I've prayed for you. Now the battle rages. The disciples don't really understand the nature of the battle, but the Lord Jesus does. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you. Why did he have to desire to have him? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is a king in his own right, whether he's ruling, ruling over this earth or not. Amen. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. He never lost that title. He never gave it up. Nor, nor did he ever give up his deity. Amen. Nor did he ever give up his holiness. Right. Nor did he ever give up his purity. And so when he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, Satan knew where to go to get Simon, Peter. He went to the Lord Jesus. And what did the Lord Jesus say, I'm doing for you, Simon? I'm praying for you. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ saw that what it took for Simon to be victorious over the assault of the devil was prayer, what makes us think that we're any different? He said, I'm praying for you. I'm going to pray that your faith fail not. But right in the same context, just a few verses later, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die on the tree. They're coming to get me. He said, but do you have a cloak? If you do, sell it and buy a sword. 
In plain words, he said to his disciples, I want to prepare you for the future. I want you to understand that things are transitioning now. We are no longer offering the kingdom of heaven to Israel. That's all past. That's all past and done. That is future. It will happen one day yes, in the millennium. They'll have it. Amen. But he said, now you're moving into the future. Prepare yourself. Go get a sword. Amen. Now, when he told them to go get that sword, he was preparing them for the kind of world it was going to be. He said, this kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. My observation of this world is that men play word games, but when it comes down to the nitty-gritty, it's who's got the biggest guns. Amen. That's a fact. That's a fact. If you listen to some fool out here, some, some, some Democrat fool to tell you to disarm and take your weapons and lay them down and disarm yourself, I guarantee you within 24 hours they'll be coming on our shores and they'll march right through the streets of, of, of America. They'll tear down your flag and they'll raise their flag and they'll pull their guns on you. They'll do it in a heartbeat. Why? They take it by force. And they will take it from you by force. This is why that you have to fight. This is why the Bible soldiers we sang about, you have to fight the good fight of faith. You have to fight. This that I'm doing tonight, and I'm trying to give this out to you, is as much a battle, a fight, as if a man had a weapon in his hands in mortal combat, because this is mortal combat. This is combat for your soul. Amen. I don't hear much of this. I don't hear too many preachers, but I don't listen to too many, so I, you can't say a whole lot about that. But there's not a whole lot, as far as I know, being said about the very nature of what's going on today. Here's what goes on. This Christmas, this Christmas, the news media that has no more use for this Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ than a dead dog. Right. But every Christmas time, the news media will come out and they'll do these little documentaries about how they're fighting over here in Iraq and they're fighting down here in the Sudan and they're fighting over here and they're fighting. And so we do not realize the promise of peace from the Bible. As if to say that the Bible really isn't true when it says that peace is coming. That's the idea. That's exactly the implications in what they're saying. They're assaulting the scripture. And people just sit there and think, well, you know, What's happened? Where did we fail? We didn't fail. Say, where did he fail? I remember not too long ago, some bold, arrogant, so-called preacher got up and he said, Jesus Christ failed when he was here 2,000 years ago. He failed, and he said, so I'm going to pick up where he let off, left off, and I'm going to finish his work. Now, folks, that's blasphemy. That's pure blasphemy. Did he fail, preacher? No, he didn't fail. He didn't fail. No, he didn't fail. He never put us in this world to bring peace to this world. When you get a man saved, you bring peace to him. America has enjoyed a 300 and something, 400 years of, of, of relative peace because of the fact that we've had a great number of Christians in this country, Bible-believing Christians that read their Bible and pray and, and has affected greatly the United States of America. But now it's turned from its roots. It's turned away from its, where it came from. It's forgotten what it's about. It's adrift in the sea and it has no rudder. Has no, it, has no, it has no compass. It doesn't know where it's going. Anything goes in the nation now. And it's coming apart at the seams. What a sad, sad thing. Did the church fail, preacher? Well, what's the church here for? Listen carefully to what I'm saying. Put these things together. Has the church failed, a preacher? No, the church hasn't failed. The Lord Jesus Christ said, occupy until I come. He said, occupy. He said, go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. Carry it out and tell men and women about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, I'll build my church. There's something about the church that, 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 it, that it's only God, that's the Lord Jesus, that can build his church. We can't build it. He, he, he builds it. He builds it. Amen. You can fill it full of people, but that's not building his church. Amen. He builds his church by born-again believers. Amen. So they're still taking it by force tonight. Right now, at this very minute, while I'm standing before you, Muslims are murdering their own Muslims. Amen. Muslims kill more Muslims than anybody else kills Muslims. Amen. They do. They're killing each other. 
I read an article right before I came to church tonight how a high-ranking general in our military, three, four-star general, was kicked out of the military because he used the term jihadist, Muslim killers. He did not walk the party line. He did not, they, they warned him apparently, I don't know what they did, but, but the bottom line is he refused to, to, to sing their song and they kicked him out. They kicked him out. That's what's happening in the country. You know why? Because the one worlders want to America to capitulate and roll over dead. Europe already has. There's not much left on this earth holding back the tsunami. And America is experiencing one of its worst hours right now. Right now. So the violent take it by force. So what's our hope then, preacher? It is our hope. He's the hope. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's called our hope. We look for him. The Bible said, he that hath this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. That means that if you have the blessed hope, and that's the Lord Jesus, he's the blessed hope, it separates you. It sanctifies you. It pulls you out of the crowd. You should tonight, if you're really plugged in with what's happening, and you're not living in a cave somewhere, you should be on the edge looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus. You could appear at any moment. Amen. I've never seen a time like this. Such an exciting thing. You see, he gave the Apostle Paul a mystery. And that mystery is that I'm going to come and take up the bride. Ye shall not all sleep, but ye shall be changed. The mystery of the rapture of the church. And we're right at that point. Now, we've gone through cycles. Back, in the, back in the, when I first came to Temple, it was all about the alignment of the planets. I heard tapes about the alignment of the planets, the alignment of the planets. Listen for hours to the alignment of the planets. What came of it, preacher? Zip. Zilch. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing came of it. And then you had this phase pass through and this fad come through and this one and this one and this one and this one. But it just seems like that what's happening now has just snuck up on all the prophecy teachers. It's just kind of come in on them. And they really don't know what to say. They don't know what to say. When is the last time you heard any prophecy teacher talking about tens of thousands of people going into Europe? Did you ever hear a prophecy teacher tell you that Great Britain was going to pull out of the European Union? Did you hear these prophecy teachers tell you anything vaguely that appears to, to line up with what, what's happening? No. It's because they don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. I have never in my few short years that I've been saved... I have never been more excited Amen. about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. than I am now. Amen. I am now. I am now. He's going to come back, yes. and he's going to Amen. catch us up to meet him in the clouds. And I hope you're looking for him. Amen. He'll appear the second time without sin into salvation for those who, appear, who love his appearing. Yes. You know what that means? That means if you're truly born again, you're going to be looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And don't be caught up with the surfeiting in this world and with, the, and with what's going on in this world. Get up every day if you get up, if you make it up, because you may not make it out of bed. <laughs> but when you get up, get up looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. I have no more hope. I put no more stock in the upcoming election in November than I do in my faith in man. And this is my faith in man. Amen. They'll promise you the moon. But when it comes down to what really happens, we'll see. Amen. We'll see. I'll do my duty, and I'll go to the polls, and I'll vote. But when I walk out of there, it'll be with mixed feelings and mixed emotions. There's just too much stuff coming from both sides. So what's that say, preacher? It says that man does not have the answer. 
The answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Even so come. All right. They take it by force. They're going to continue to take it by force. And the kingdoms of this world will be that until the Son of Man comes. And when he comes, he will take the kingdoms of this world. And they'll become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Father, in thy name I pray that you'd use what I've said tonight. Use it for the glory of God. Brethren, bless my brothers and my sisters that have come out tonight to hear your word, to sing, to pray, to worship you, glorify your holy name. You're our life, Lord. You're our life. And we have nothing without you. In thy blessed, sweet, holy name we pray. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. All right, stand up tonight. <clears throat>